All right, so we're recording. All right, so I haven't made a video in a while that I can say that had anything to do with local history or the East Coast versus the Midwest. All right, so going to give a little history lesson, and uh, hopefully you all understand and enjoy. I'm out here spraying on ground. Uh, there's soybeans in here. Yes, there are. Uh, I could probably point out a couple of them. They're just coming up right through the ground there. Uh, put them in at about an inch and a half deep. That's where I want them inch inch and a half deep That's all you need to go with soybeans, but a few months ago or a month ago about a month ago or a month and a half ago I was talking about regenerative agriculture and guys talking about their organic matter and they got plenty of organic matter and how how modern farming practices does not impact uh, uh, Organic matter by use the use of uh, anhydrous ammonia it doesn't destroy the it doesn't destroy the the microbiome in the soil and that is all a lie okay it does it impacts it impacts now you've got enough organic matter ie co2 carbon in your soil that has been in the soil for literally eons thousands of years before modern agriculture and that soil runs really really deep so the soils in the East Coast have been farmed for hundreds of years longer than the soils in the Midwest, you know, like the Corn Belt, the Grain Belt of the country. Uh, here on, in New Jersey, where I am, along the Delaware River, which is only about a mile that way, um, and Trenton is about 40 miles that way, up north here is Easton. So I sit in that area, right in there, just under the nose of New Jersey. If you look at the New Jersey as a fetus looking thing, that's what it is. So, 1492, Chris Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and then there was this huge, uh, huge migration from Europe where they settled the East Coast all the way from Maine to Florida, all right? And they did. Florida, not so much because it was an inhospitable area. So what I'm getting at is that the ground here, let's see, let's just say by the mid 1500s, this was settled by 1560. Just go from 1492, just say from 1500 to 1600, they were slash cutting, taking the lumber off of here, sending it over to England, Spain, where France, wherever they needed it to go back across the pond. And then it was, they started the modern agriculture age. So by slash cutting, they cleared the ground and they disturbed the whole ecosystem. So the first settlers did destroy the forest area. That type of stuff right over there. Now, as you see all those dead trees, those are the ash. The ash have been killed off by the emerald ash borer that was brought in from, you guessed it, Ch -ch -ch China. Okay, so that's where that came from, the emerald ash borer. Those things, there are going to be some survivors, and those will be what repropagates the, the species. It, they say it will not go extinct, but we were hit really hard here. Anyway, so I made another video about rocks, and guys out west are like, well, we don't have rocks. Well, you do have rocks, but those rocks are much, much deeper than what you're farming at. So I'm going to show you a prime example of erosion hundreds of years of erosion due to European settlements and activities here in New Jersey. Right here is what we call a fast rock. This is a fast rock, okay? It is stuck fast to the ground. It is ginormous. This is probably a 20-ton boulder under here. It is what we call blue jingle. Teresa ran right, well, actually, I ran right over it with the, the grain drill. And however many pounds a... Uh, John Deere 750 grain drill puts to the uh, ground. It just made little scratches in the rock. You can see the beans are here. Um, this rock at one time was submerged under about a foot or so of topsoil. Yeah, a foot or so of topsoil. What I am standing on and looking down in is probably two foot of erosion from this rock. So this rock at one point was a foot to two feet deep under topsoil and due to modern agriculture, plowing. When I say modern agriculture, I'm talking about uh, European agriculture. Oxen, horse and plow, plowed, worked, washed away, plowed, worked, washed away, plowed, worked, washed away because right down there is a ditch. 
Now, if you see the way this field lays, there is a stone wall down in there. Okay? It is just beyond those dead trees. There's a stone wall. There's a stone wall in there. If I was to walk to that stone wall, the stone wall has a washout underneath it and the walls have fallen over because of erosion. All right? So, as modern agriculture, horse and plow, harrows, just that sort of thing, plowing under cultivation, you take a cultivator through a corn crop, you get an inch rainstorm and a portion of that soil moves and it moves downhill. So if you can see, which I don't think you can see, is that where that fence line is, they put a fence there, the, it slopes down and then it comes up. It actually has created a wetland in there due to all of the silt or sediment or topsoil that has come off of this field and has been caught by the fence line, stones and things like that. And hold your horses, I got a phone call coming in. Hold on. Okay, so that's hay that I have to bail. Now, I'm going to show you the mass of this rock. There is no other rock in this field but that big rock right there. And I'm going to walk around here and I'll show you the size of this rock. So I'm walking the outer perimeter of that rock. Here's a section of that rock right there. And it goes from way over there. It's huge. This thing that's probably, oh, 20, 20, yeah, about 20 feet from here to the other side, maybe a little bit farther, might be 21, 22 feet. Uh, and it goes up to about, it's the circumference of it is probably across 20 feet, across that whole thing. And it comes up and then it dips down. So there is hundreds of years of erosion that the fellows out in the Midwest that they don't have. So what erodes? Your topsoil. What goes with the topsoil? All your microbes, all your carbon, all the good stuff that will grow a crop. So I'm not telling anybody how to farm. I really am not telling anybody how to farm. But I will tell you this. If the farming practices that are used today around the country and in the Midwest continue the way that they are within a hundred years you're going to have eroded all your topsoil away if not all of it 50% of it and then after that hundred years it's going to be dead soil so there's dead soil all up and down the East Coast when I go to North Carolina that soil is dead as a doornail and when I say dead as a doornail I mean it is dead without commercial fertilizer nothing will grow commercial fertilizer does need microbes to break it down to make it an organic form that the plants that you are feeding take it up. So as you diminish the life of your soil by removing the organic matter or not or organic residue or not allowing organic uh, or yeah organic matter to build in your soil through the erosion process, through the aeration process. So when you plow and plow and plow and plow and work and plow and disc and plow and disc and disc, best invention since I've been alive has been the vertical tillage machine, in my opinion, because it only works the top two inches, okay? And it, you don't have to really go over it 100 times to get the effect that you want. Um, really, if you want to resize your residue, a one-time pass, resize your residue, very little disturbance. You, the, your corn, your grain drill, or your uh, or your your corn planter will punch through any of that stuff that's in there, and it will only aerate the top two inches, inch and a half to two inches that you've worked. Now, the roots roots in the Midwest they go much deeper than that. Corn roots can go at, at least 10 to 12 feet deep. Here on the East Coast, they go to hard pan, which is about three feet, two and a half to three feet of clay. Clay can be converted into topsoil. It just takes plants like this. This is a, uh, this is reed canary grass. Reed canary puts a deep root into it. Um, the soil that you are, or the, the, the weeds that are on your soil are an indication of how sick your soil is. So if you've got a whole vast majority of different types of weeds, um, those weeds all do a different job to help build your soil back up. What I have here is acidic soil. The soil is acidic. 
um, over there was limed and then there was a section here that they had trees and they planted trees in here and I didn't lime this side so this particular type of ground cover wild strawberry or bramble briars and other things uh, are actually sweetening the soil yes sweetening the soil it takes acidic soil to grow them when they grow they sweeten the soil when the soil is sweetened enough that they can no longer survive something else takes over and generally what takes over is a prairie grass or and there is none of that in here because of the way i've been farming it with cool season grasses and those cool season grasses i.e uh, reed canary grass, there's fescue, there's buckhorn. This had Timothy on it at one time. Uh, it's still here, but if you walk just over there of a 50 yards and it's all grass, none of this crazy weeds. I will be liming it this fall after I take the beans off. I will be putting a liquid calcium down too. So the liquid calcium will feed those beans and keep them up and running so that they continue to grow throughout the whole thing. And like that there's a soybean right there they're all over in here because i planted them <laughs> anyway i hope you understand if you're from the midwest and you don't understand why we don't have organic matter that's why it washed away down the ditch down the delaware uh, river down to the uh what are you doing young man you don't do that look at this little guy he's in here terrorizing the place. get your butt up here and get on your seat you need to be in oh shoot I just bent my fingernail backwards. It's time to clip those. Um, yeah, so if you're in the Midwest and and you think that your soils will not deteriorate to the point where there's no topsoil left, I'm just going to tell you again. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. There is a big push. Now, I know there's a lot of people that are going to complain about this, and I'm not telling anybody how to farm. I don't, I don't want anybody to change anything that they like doing. If you like recreational tillage, go do it. If that's what you want to do, you want to burn fuel and wear out equipment, go ahead and do that because the equipment company is building new pieces of equipment every single day to compensate for your wear and tear, which is fine. I choose not to do that. Um, this is the way it is going to go. There are certain individuals in, the, in our government that know that we are destroying our topsoil. They, they also know that there's two things that have to happen. Either there has to be a depopulation of people, which I think is what they're working on, or they're going to make you farm this way. There are already incentives to do this through your farm service agency, even though I do not succumb to the government when it comes to that style of farming. I am doing this on my own, on my own dollar, I am not receiving one penny of subsidy. I know Zach Johnson, uh, the millennial farmer on his TikTok, that is the real Zach Johnson on TikTok. If you don't know the real Zach Johnson, you haven't seen his TikTok, that is the real Zach Johnson. The Zach Johnson that you know from YouTube is just an actor that plays Zach Johnson on YouTube uh, for an audience, which, you know, is fine. But the TikTok Zach Johnson, I like that guy better. There's a reason, because he's real there. Um, not saying Zach Johnson, the actor, isn't real on YouTube. It's just he's really real on TikTok. Kind of like I am on YouTube. Now, I could go that route, but I'm not going to. But anyways, this is what planting green, extensive cover crops, all of that stuff, the government is going to force farmers to do it. As the prices of food continue to climb, which they will continue to climb, uh, as they climb and continue to climb, the government is going to get involved because a happy population is a well-fed population. An unhappy population is a hungry population. So when food becomes very becomes scarce due to the loss of topsoil worldwide, we're not talking today here, in New Jersey, we're talking across the entire globe. The modern medicines make people live longer, um, whether they're happy or not while they're living longer. I don't think so, but you know, that's just, that's just the way that is. But it is, 
it is, uh, you know, it is something that is going to be addressed to the disdain of most farmers. Farmers don't like change. I don't like change. I will tell you that right now. I, I like to work the ground. I like to, I love to work the ground. I like to plow. I like to work. I like to, I like to do that activity. But when you figure it out and it comes to your brain like, you know what? Why is it that when we get a drought, that fence line is always nice and green and even though it's overgrown, why is that fence line always nice and green? And trees take an awful lot of water to make them grow. It's just a fact. Um, why is that nice and green and I can reach down into the ground and it's soft and the tilth of it is like crumbles in your hands? Why is that? And when I go out into my field, it's crusted over and the, the, the crop that I'm going to make money on is no longer going to make me money. When you figure that out, then you'll realize that what we've been doing in the modern agricultural age is not going to last. It's a dog running to the end of its chain, just like that. That's what it is. Eventually it gets there and it breaks its neck. Uh, food shortages, I think there's a few things at play there, but I also believe that um, it can be helped. And all that green stuff that's out there that I just terminated with a product that terminates it, I won't use the name of it because it gets all the city, it's upset. Um, I use that product. Uh, it terminates it. That then becomes food for microbiology, microbial bi bacteria in the soil and fungus in the soil. I'm not using fungicides and insecticides because those are the two worst things for your soil. If you don't understand that, then you haven't read a book in the last 10 years on why fungicides and insecticides are helping to erode the soils in our lives. And we need soil. You know, people that get out and work in the soil are generally healthy people. My grandmother cultivated a garden for her entire life. She died when she was 95 years old with a bad heart. And her heart was bad for a while. But anyway, she lived a long life. I'm not saying that everybody that works in the soil gets to live that long, uh, but my grandmother did. My other grandmother did too. She had a garden, a beautiful garden. When she got older, she gave it up. And now she has dementia. But that's life. So anyway, I'm going to shut up now. Me and William are going to go. And uh, yeah, just because I'm doing something different doesn't mean I've lost my mind. Um, read some books, get some information, and try it. Just try it. And I'm not saying you're going to get the best yield in the world, because you're not. It's the bottom line. How much did it cost you to plant that? How much did it cost you to harvest that? How much did it cost you to fertilize it? And how much did it cost you to keep the weeds down? And in the end, if you made more money on a lower yield, which a lot of people can't compute that, but I'm pretty sure you'll be able to understand it. Less inputs means less, less money spent. And uh, yeah, you can make a lot more money by getting less and also relying less on a chemical company. Yeah.